Today, I'm going to discuss the objectification and sexualization of women in recent mainstream media. We must first consider the question, should advertising agencies be allowed to objectify or hypersexualize women to further profit? Let's first define some terms. What is objectification? Well, according to Nathan A. Hafleck and Jamie L. Goldenberg in their article, Seeing Eye to Body, The Literal Objectification of Women, objectification or literal objectification occurs when a person is perceived as or behaves object-like. Now, another key note is that objectification doesn't necessarily focus on the sexual parts of the body, like the hips and breasts. This happens in dehumanization, when a person is given animalistic traits rather than human traits. Dehumanization is more typical in media when women are depicted sexually. Now we come to the term, what is sexualization? Well, according to Fabio Fasali and Federica Durante in Shades of Sexualization, when sexualization becomes objectification, sexualization has two types. The first is beauty-based. The second is sexually-based when there's a focus on the person's sexual features and expected desires by implying his or her sexual readiness. Now, we come to a mix of these terms, sexual objectification. According to Fasoli and Durante, sexual objectification is the represent representation of a person as a mere body or object for others' sexual desires. Now let's get into some background. Why do advertisers use women's sexuality in media? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. These photos and images are sexually alluring and grab people's attention. Furthermore, there's a simplicity in this. Audiences are more likely to be persuaded to buy a product if the advertising narrative is easily recognizable and frequently repeated. In this sense, this is a system that feeds itself. As the sexualized narrative repeats and becomes more mainstream and recognizable, people will continue to do this. Another aspect of why advertisers use women's sexuality in media is because, for reasons I get into later, women are not as bothered by sex in mainstream media as they used to be. Now let's discuss sexuality as power. There's a new type of feminism called third wave feminism or sex positive feminism that began in the 1980s and embraces the idea of sexuality and girl power. The main value of third wave feminism, according to Amanda Zimmerman and John Dallenberg in their article, Sexual Objectification of Women in Advertising, a Contemporary Cultural Perspective, the main value is sexual liberation, which promotes a sex-positive culture that values consent between partners and aims to liberate both men and women. Now, according to Krista Thompson in a Huffington Post article, women should be free to embrace their power and it should be free to express it. She argues that guys want sex and girls do too, but women should be able to bestow it on the deserving. Women have complete control over their own body, and it is their responsibility to keep it safe and healthy. Guys do not have this power, and the only way he could have power is that if he either pays for the sex or rapes the woman. She also argues that complete industries are based on sexualization, for example, the beauty industry and the fashion industry. One of her prime examples, as seen in this picture, is Miley Cyrus. To summarize a quote from Zimmerman and Dahlberg, women are strong and powerful. They can be anything they want to be and look hot doing it. Zimmerman and Dahlberg speak a lot about advertising. Over the past few decades, there has been a decrease of women in traditional roles in advertising, such as the housewife. But there has been an increase of the sexual objectification of women in advertising. Overall, sex has become a major part of mainstream media. However, consumers have not been making decisions to buy products based on the objectification and sexualization of women. It seems that consumers are making decisions independently of how women are portrayed in advertising. 
Zimmerman and Dahlberg believe it's just because consumers are constantly surrounded by sex and media, so it's just part of the culture. Now we'll talk about the detrimental effects of sexuality in recent media. According to Nathan A. Halfleck and Jamie L. Goldenberg in the article Seeing Eye to Body, there has been an increase of focus on the physical attributes rather than the mental attributes of women in media. By focusing on people's physical attributes in advertising, studies have found that these individuals are objectified and dehumanized, often in a sexualized manner. According to the APA, the American Psychological Association, the effects of such sexualization are detrimental to the health of individuals, particularly adolescents. According to a survey performed by the APA, these consequences can be broken down into three main categories. The first is cognitive and emotional. According to the survey, sexualization and objectification undermine a person's confidence in and comfort with her own body. This can lead to emotional and self-image problems such as shame and anxiety. Secondly, there can be mental and physical consequences. Research links sexualization with the three most mental health problems diagnosed in girls and young women which are eating disorders, low self-esteem, and depression. The third consequence is sexual development. Research suggests that the sexualization of girls has negative consequences on the girl's ability to develop a healthy sexual self-image. Thus, I have concluded that advertising agencies should not be allowed to hypersexualize women for profit because this sexualization creates a false image as the norm for women, further promoting the negative stereotype that women are only valued for their sexual appeal. My belief stems from numerous scientific backings made by the APA and other reliable sources. One of these studies I found particularly interesting. Described in Fasoli's and Durante's Shades of Sexualization, when sexualization becomes sexual objectification, they created a study which had six female models featured, each with three different types of images taken. The first type of image was a non-revealing image, where the model wore clothes and the images were not sensual. The second was merely revealing, meaning the model wore swimwear, underwear, but the overall positioning and facial features were non-sexual. And the third type of picture was sexually revealing, meaning that this model was still wearing swimwear or underwear, but they had sensual posing and facial expressions. From the study came multiple conclusions. Firstly, merely being undressed is sufficient enough for observers to perceive a woman as lacking competence or perceive a woman as more object-like. It was thus hypothesized that nudity was an activator for objectification. This was further exacerbated in sexually revealing photographs where the model was hypersexualized. It is important to note that nudity itself did not alter levels of sexiness. To restate, both non-revealing and revealing images were viewed with the same level of sexiness. Only in hypersexualized images was there an increase in perceived sexiness. In general, as nudity increased, there was a decrease in the perception of competence. Merely undressing was sufficient enough for observers to perceive a woman as lacking competence or more object-like. It is clear to me that no matter how much someone believes in sexual freedom and girl power, the objectification of women will persist. And it is the consequences of this objectification and sexualization outlined by the APA that prompts me to stand by my argument that advertising agencies should not be allowed to objectify and hypersexualize women for profit in current media.